Hello and welcome to the Mystic Cast, where you join me, Jack Stafford, a student of metaphysics, as I talk to a variety of guests to better understand the teachings given by the masters through the Aetherius Society, the new cosmic religion for the Aquarian Age, incorporating all yogas, Christian mysticism, theosophy, UFOs, ancient civilizations, and much, much more. Please note, this is an independent program, not produced or fact-checked by the Aetherius Society. Today, my guest is Michael Kramer. Hello, Michael. Hi. How are you doing? Oh, pretty good. How are you? I'm pretty good. Thank you. So you're a, you're a big name in the field of ancient civilizations, and I'm really pleased to be able to speak to you because uh, in my uh, in my humble opinion, there's three things that, pe that the silence group want to keep quiet, and that's uh, UFOs, uh, our ancient history, our real our real history and reincarnation. And so we're here today to talk about the middle one. And I think they're all related. <laughs> they're all, they are all related. Yeah. I mean, if you imagine if you, you know, if you're interested in ancient civilizations, it puts a different perspective. If you, if you think, well, I was there, I probably built those pyramids. You know, if you're an Egyptologist and you're obsessed with Egypt, chances are perhaps you were, you were there, you feel a great connection. So. Um, and I know you've been on the ancient alien series as well, so that it all ties in. Yeah, definitely does. So how do you feel about this? Cause you've been doing this a long time now. Do you, are you, where, where's your, where are you in the emotional scale? Are you like, are you jaded and you think, well, I've done all the work now, believe it or not, take it, take it what you will. I'm not trying to convince you anymore. It's it, all the evidence is there. Do what you will. Well, I think I've always had that attitude that. Yeah, all I can do is present what makes sense to me, what I think is might be valuable for other people and just leave it up to them what they're going to do with it. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think that's always been you yeah. know, one kind of attitude. I'm not into trying to compel or f force anyone to accept my ideas i just put them out there and if someone takes it up fine if they don't that's their decision their freedom so you passed any frustrations about people not listening um uh, i i wouldn't say i'm frustrated it just seems to be a fact of of life that in the universe, there's always been two, basically two categories of, of persons, those that are moving towards darkness and those that are moving toward light. So it's, uh, out of my control. Really. <laughs> those that want to listen, will listen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how do you feel about people who have come on after you, like people like Graham Hancock, who, you know, they cite your work, but you were one of the originals and. Well, uh, Graham Hancock, I think is doing wonderful work. Uh, he actually wrote a, a foreword for one of my books, the hidden history of the human race some time ago. And occasionally we run into each other at conferences where we're both speaking. Uh, but, you know, he has his area of research, I have mine. And, yeah, you know, they, they overlap in some ways, but they're not exactly the same. But I, I think he's followed a, a path that many of us who get into these things go through, which is we might start out with archaeology, stones, bones, artifacts, monuments, but it leads gradually to other things mm -hmm. because you get into the whole alternative cosmology field, which tends to involve uh, a consciousness-based universe rather than a strictly matter-based universe and that gets you into spiritual practices and mind altering, consciousness alter 
life-altering types of experiences. So I, I, I think a, a, a lot of us in these fields have kind of progressed in, in that way. That's really interesting. So you start out trying to convince the materialists or, or arguing on their terms, using material evidence to try and convince them. But then as you get further into it, because I know you're, you've come from a Vedic background, you've yeah. very into this and because the consciousness and things like that is if you try and prove that with prove non-material things with material things, it's, you're arguing in just two different languages though. Yeah. So, uh, ultimately I regard what I do as part of my practice of yoga. I, I a practitioner of bhakti yoga, the yoga of devotion. And part of that practice is to use whatever talent or ability one might have for a higher spiritual purpose. And, you know, somehow or other, I got some ability to string words together on a page, um, to write in other words, and, and yeah, I've taken, I could use that ability for many different things, but I've chosen to apply it in, in, in this field of alternative understandings of human origins and integrity with the idea of bringing uh, people who, who may be interested in these topics and not already committed to them uh, to an improved understanding of their real nature. It's interesting you say back to yoga, I would have thought nanny yoga than the yoga of wisdom because you're all about knowledge and studying and Yes, uh, that is with bhakti, with devotion also comes knowledge. Mm. Like my, uh, my guru, Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, his name actually reflects that. Bhakti Vedanta, devotion and Vedic knowledge uh, together. Because without that background of knowledge, sometimes devotion can be just some sentimentality without any real foundation. So I, I think both things are important. The bhakti, the devotion, the love, and also knowledge and understanding. Exactly. All the yogas are tied in together and it's karma yoga as well. It's action because you're going to conferences, you're writing books, you're working. Yes. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. It includes karma as well. Okay. As a matter of fact, that's what that word is there in, in my uh, spiritual name that I got at the time I was initiated, Druja Karma, which is uh, a name for Vishnu or Krishna uh, that means more or less fast work. So, so where do we start then with this conversation is I suppose we go back to, to the materialistic aspect and the, and the evidence from, from your, from your book, um, forbidden archeology, span um, what, how would you, what would you like to start? What, after all your years, what is, you think is the most important things that people well, can grasp? Yeah. Well, let me try to relate, uh, the work that I did in that book, Forbidden Archaeology, with the larger questions of Vedic cosmology and spirituality. Uh, forbidden Archaeology contains archaeological evidence that shows human beings have existed on this planet for hundreds of millions of years basically going all the way back to the very beginnings of the history of life on earth. 
And that information is given in the Puranas, which are the historical writings of ancient India. And the significance of that is that ultimately the universe has a purpose. And I believe its purpose is to be like an educational facility for conscious selves who have come to this level of reality for whatever reason. It's an opportunity for them to uh, perfect their consciousness, uh, to become free of all kinds of behaviors and mentalities that lead to so many of the problems that we see in the world around us. So if that is the purpose and that purpose is achieved in the human bodily vehicle, it makes sense that that human bodily vehicle that is capable of reaching those understandings would be available right from the beginning. Right. Just like we send a, a space station up into Earth orbit, uh, we don't just hope that somehow or other the chemicals in the space station will combine together and form some first simple living thing and hope that it will evolve into astronauts. <laughs> no, we set the space station up because we have astronauts that are going to be sitting in it and working and researching. So uh, I think that's the ultimate significance of this evidence that human beings have existed on this planet for vast periods of time is means we need new explanations for human origins and they're going to involve consciousness, which is an unsolved mystery for modern science. What kind of evidence did you find? Was it, was it footprints or artifacts and how did you date it? Was it carbon dating or the level that it was found at? Yeah. Very good questions, Jack. Uh, Yes, the evidence takes the form of human skeletal remains, human footprints, and artifacts normally attributed to Homo sapiens, human beings like us, by archaeologists. And this evidence is not found in the current textbooks of archaeology. You really have to dig into the history of archaeology and look at all the reports uh, originally given by archaeologists, geologists, other scientists looking it into the earth, digging into it. And when I did that, I found hundreds of reports of scientists, of, including archaeologists, finding these things. And I, I give an example from uh, the earlier history of archaeology. In the 19th century, gold was discovered in California, and miners went there to get the gold. Uh, they were going to places like Table Mount in the Sierra Nevada Mountains in central California. And they were digging tunnels into the sides of that mountain to get out the gold uh, bearing deposits. And deep inside the tunnels and the solid rock, you know, they found human bones and human artifacts, stone mortars and pestles, obsidian spear points, and also human skeletal remains. And these came to the attention of the chief government geologist of California, a Harvard University educated geologist named uh, Dr. J.D. Whitney. And 
he collected these artifacts. He did his own research and studies to confirm them. And he reported them to the scientific world in a book published by Harvard University. Now, what makes these discoveries so interesting to me is that they were found as layers of rock that modern geologists tell us are about 50 million years old. Now, the current scientific consensus is human beings like us appeared only about 300,000 years ago at most. And before that, they say, well, there were no human beings like us on this planet. So they were a really significant discovery, but we don't hear very much about them today because of the process of knowledge filtration that operates in the world of science. Uh, Dr. Whitney had a contemporary, uh, Dr. William Holmes, who was uh, an anthropologist working at the Smithsonian Institution in uh, Washington, D.C. And Dr. Holmes said, if Dr. Whitney had understood the theory of evolution by natural selection, he wouldn't have published those findings of his. In other words, he would have known mm. can't possibly be true because it contradicts you know, mm, the theory the that's uh, dominant. So those artifacts are still in a museum at the University of California at Berkeley. They're not displayed to the public, but they are there. I've seen them, photographed them. And it, you know, it, it, I've also gone into the Sierra Nevada mountains and looked into some of these old gold, gold mining tunnels. So it should be possible to do new research there and get further confirmation of these things. But if, if this happened just one or two times, you know, this knowledge filtering that results in uh, a discovery not being so well known. If it happened just one or two times, then he might be able to say, okay, well, there are a few anomalies, you know, but, you know, the vast majority of evidence confirms our present theories. But it, it, this knowledge filtering didn't happen just one or two or three times, it's happened hundreds of times. So what happens is we wind up with uh, an incomplete set of facts to make our judgments about these things. Mm -hmm. So, so that's just one example. I'm sure I know there's many in the book. So can I just ask a question about, because in the theory society, we understand that the, the teaching theory society that that civilization, it peaks like Lemurius and then goes down and then Atlantis and up and down. And then the age we're in now, I mean, you know, if you think, if you think 150 years ago, they, how quickly, you know, invented the, we've gone from inventing the bicycle to space travel in, if you, civilization could go really up. So is it right that, because you're talking about pestle and mortar and finding, we think about, you know, it's not possible that civilization stayed at, you know, 18, uh, hundreds of millions of years and we're all cavemen for all that time. I mean, there must've been these peaks. So is it, is it possible that only stone and bone are preserved for a long time? If they, if there was plastic and paper and other complex items that they would have been destroyed over these millions of years under all this pressure of, of the rock. Um, yeah, I, I think you're, you're right about that. Uh, one thing is, it's not only paper and plastic are e easily destroyed or they uh, disintegrate. Uh, even, say, if you have a, a laptop computer like I'm using right now, uh, it doesn't last very long in terms of geological time. You know, it's uh, 
made of metals and plastic. Say if at the same time that some people were using stone tools and weapons 50 million years ago in California, for example, mm -hmm. to stick with that, that case. If at the same time they were using laptop computers, over 50 million years, the stall isn't going to change that much. Mm. If it's not exposed to uh, you know, disturbance. But uh, the laptop computer, you know, the plastics in it are going to dissolve. The metals will oxidize unless there's gold there or a few other rare metals that don't oxidize. It's one reason gold is considered so valuable, doesn't oxidize. So it's, uh, uh, so after, you know, 50 million years, there may have been a whole industrial civilization, just like ours that, uh, was present, but you would be able to detect very much about it. And there were some studies done a few years ago by, you know, there's one researcher, he wrote a book called World Without Us. Yeah, they, these are environmental studies because our industrial civilization has kind of polluted the environment and disturbed it a bit. So sometimes environmentalists wonder, well, what would happen if human beings disappeared from the earth? today mm, and yeah. what would happen with our whole, all our cities, our factories, all our products, what would happen? And they've kind of concluded that over the course of a few thousand years, you know, the, the automobiles, anything made of metal would oxidize, mm. you know, the buildings would gradually collapse. Most of them were made of concrete and mm -hmm. steel. They're not meant to last steel. these days. Huh? They're not meant to build, they're not built to last like they were. Yeah. So, I mean, the concrete will rot, the steel beams will eventually corrode. The things will collapse and fires will burn. Mm -hmm the floods, tsunamis, that, and so that over a few hundred thousand years, it's say practically everything would be gone. So, but on your main point that civilizations go up and, and down, I, I believe that definitely is a fact. If you look at some of the descriptions of the ancient civilizations given in the Puranas, the Vedic historical texts, you'll find that uh, they had a uh, flying craft. They're called Vimanas. There were cities with palaces and government buildings and residential quarters. And, you know, so there, it, it, this. You're right. This isn't the first time that advanced civilization has arisen on Earth. Have you have there been any examples in the in the archaeological digs of what we would call sophisticated technology being preserved in any way? Well, uh, there are a few things. They're not very old in, in terms of millions of years. I mean, I think they're basically two sources of evidence about what's happened in the past. And one is what we can find in the archeological record. And what's preserved there isn't a very complete record because as you were saying, things high, what we consider to be high tech stuff doesn't really last very long, but yeah. You, you do have some things like the Antikyra mechanism, which was found in a, a Greek ship that sunk in the Aegean Sea somewhere. 
an ancient Greek ship. It, it had uh, this, it was recovered a long time ago, but the archaeologist who first recovered this object didn't understand what it was. It looked just like a bunch of metal just mm-hmm. melted or something. But when they developed technologies for uh, X-ray, the interior of this metal, they noticed all kinds of gear wheels all stuck mm-hmm. together. Oh, right. I've seen this one. Yeah. Yeah. Boulder cogs. Yeah. Yeah. With uh, engravings of the different planets, planetary mm-hmm. signs on them. And they've determined, well, this is actually a, a computer, you know, for calculating the positions of the stars and planets, you know, a, a very elaborate computing machine. So you do have things like like that and and then then there are all now this isn't scientific evidence but if you go to different temples in india sometimes they will display things that works of art or objects sacred objects that are said to be millions of years old you know, from different ages different yugas they're called in Sanskrit so you do have that sort of thing uh, hmm. but in my work I've simply been able to demonstrate that the human species has been around <laughs> for a long time. I think showing all the ups and downs of civilizations and cultures would take an additional uh, level of, of research. But whether you have a, a high civilization or a low civilization, first thing has to be there have to be human beings there. So mm. at least I, I think I can show that from the archaeological record. Now, the other type of evidence about the past is the knowledge that's come down from those ancient civilizations or those who have witnessed the the past. So you've got your records left by those civilizations. Mm -hmm. I don't know, you're... Your uh, school of thought, do you have records or that you um, rely on or Akashic information? Or? Let me share my screen. I just got this. Um, this is what we were talking about with the the Kali, the, the Yugas, the uh, Juan Kalper. Because some of these, like, for example, they were saying Atlantis was like 11,000 years ago or something like that. But according to our teachings, it was a lot longer than that because of the length of time, a, a yuga, this is from my teacher. He said the four yuga periods that equals one Maha yuga or great age is. What age does it give for a Maha yuga? A Maha yuga is 4 million. Okay. Four million three hundred twenty thousand. Yeah, that's similar. That's the traditional understanding which I follow. Okay. I know there are some others who have a different yuga system that's shorter. But I I I would agree with that that calculation. Okay. Yeah, these are these are big numbers. I mean I think that's a billion. One calper is four billion. Yeah, I mean that's <laughs> so that's a, a kalpa or a day of Brahma. Sometimes it's called right. One kalpa is one day of Brahma. Four point three two billion years. Fourteen man Vantara is one kalpa. Yes, uh, yes, that is absolutely the timeline that I accept. 
Okay. Oh, great. We're on the same page. Yeah, we're on the same page in terms of time cycles. So I have this. Um, so the we we have the Earth. The Earth site on. I think she's on her third incarnation from the Sun, according to these teachings. The Earth has a life cycle of six billion years, and we're just in. We've just reached the halfway point of the Earth's life. We believe that on July the eighth, nineteen sixty four, was the the Earth received her primary initiation. So she got energy because the Earth is a living being, and she received this energy from the Sun through her heart. But she's keeping it now in um, in abeyance. Um, we believe that we came to this Earth from from um, Maldek, which is now the asteroid belt, because we destroyed Maldek through through nuclear nuclear weapons. And then we had spent about hundred years on the hundred thousand years on the lower and higher astral planes. And then about 13 million years in the, the civilization of Lemuria. And at then, then the earth Lemuria, they, they probed the atom again and the earth turned on our axis. And so that's why there's a lot of coal remnants, you know, under the ice, under the North and South pole is because she turns, she can turn within minutes and so there would be like tidal waves four miles high and just destroy everything within within a matter of, of minutes so it's... yeah yeah my understanding is that there's a a devastation like that at the end of every mud winter. this was they said that she did this deliberately because we were not allowed to destroy another planet. We destroyed Maldek. So there was, bef so we came 18 million years ago and there was, there was Adamic man here. So maybe some of those records, because Adamic man was much bigger, a much bigger man yeah. than us and much more evolved. And, um, their, their root chakra was the heart chakra because each chakra is, we have is a realm of consciousness. And so we had to spend according to the teachings, you have to spend a hundred thousand years on the astral just because the earth had to make these different realms so that we could exist on this planet. Uh, <laughs> and so then civilization, Atlantis was destroyed, you know, these are a long time, a lot more than, um, these are big numbers now. <laughs> About 800,000 years ago, Atlantis was destroyed. And now we're in the start of Kali Yuga after the death of Lord Sri Krishna. That's, that's right. We're in the Kali Yuga. I would agree with that. So, so we have some things in common. Yeah. Yeah. Not everything, but certainly big numbers. Do you have any more questions for me? Oh, of course. Yes. Just check here. Yeah. So, because a lot of people, they talk about the missing link now, but there yeah, has never been, there's never been discovered a, a missing link between Darwin's theory of evolution. Yeah. Between the apes uh, and the. Yeah. That's what they mean by missing link. It's kind of interesting. Darwin published his book, The Origin of Species in 1859. And then uh, he didn't really speak about human evolution in that book, but many scientists started talking about it. it, it human beings are like other living things, they evolved, they must have evolved as Charles Darwin said from some ancestor, you know, they had some ancestor that was by natural selection, modified, and you know, you have this evolutionary progression. They speculated that, well, that that means human beings probably came from some ancestor that 
is of the ape and monkey family. Mm. Not exactly like the apes and monkeys that live today, but from that same group. And uh, so there must be some intermediates between the ancient apes and monkeys and the modern humans. And they called that the missing link. And then they started looking for uh, this missing link, but they weren't finding it. They were finding evidence that humans like us were existing in the distant past. So that went on through the 1860s, the 1870s, the 1880s. It was during this period that you had discoveries like Dr. Whitney's discoveries in California that we were talking about. And then in the 1890s, at the end of the 1890s, there was a discovery in Java at a site called Trino, where a Dutch researcher named Eugene Dubois found a primitive ape-like skull cap and about 50 feet away in his excavation, he found a human-like femur or thigh bone and he put, put the two together and said, this is the Java ape man, the missing way. Hmm. That's convenient. Pithecanthropus uh, erectus. It's, it's now known as uh, Homo erectus. Yeah, it's considered one of our alleged uh, hominid they're called ancestors. But uh, it was found in layers of rock about 800,000 years old. So now they have their missing link. They've been looking for it for decades, but they didn't find it. They were just finding evidence that human beings like us existed millions of years ago. So when this Java man discovery became widely accepted in the world of science at the beginning of the 20th century, end of the 19th century, then they had to decide, okay, if we've got our missing link at 800,000 years, that means anything human has to come after that. You know, sometime between the present and 800,000 years ago. And then it became a problem, but what are we gonna do with all this evidence that's accumulated between 1859 and 1899? What are we going to do with that? And that's when they started filtering it out of textbooks and scientific presentations. So that evidence has more or less just disappeared. And then after that time, whenever someone would find any evidence that looked human, older than 800,000 years, they would adjust it in some way to make it fit. Yeah. And that's still going on today. Uh, I'll just give one example and then we can move on. Uh, a couple of years ago, in 2016, there was a, a team of archaeologists working at Ulduvai Gorge and the country in these in a country in East Africa, Tanzania. And they found a finger bone. You know, just, uh, it just it seems like a pretty insignificant thing, but it, it, it does have some meaning. So they carefully measured this finger bone and they compared the measurements to the same finger bone and different species of apes, monkeys, different ape men 
like Australopithecus and Homo habilis and so forth. And they also compared it with that of anatomically modern humans. And they found it fit in the human group. It's different than any ape or monkeys, different than any hominids, you know, alleged human ancestors, and fits squarely in the human group. But it was found in layers of rock, 1,800,000 years old. So in their scientific report, the archaeologist said, this finger bone most closely resembles that of modern Homo sapiens. But we can't call it Homo sapiens because of its geological age. In other words, 1,800,000 years. So like I said, after this Java man discovery, which put their missing leg at 800,000 years, if they found anything that looked human after that, they had to interpret it in such a way that it, it would uh, contradict their paradigm. Isn't it true that in all the major museums around the world, there was a, somebody wrote a book about there are giant skeletons. There are many, many. I believe there were giants in the past. Uh, by giant, I mean somebody 10 feet tall or taller. Okay. Because there are a lot of people who are seven feet tall. They play on basketball. Yeah, make a good living. Yeah. And there are, are a few people on this planet, even today, who are eight feet tall. I think there was one man in Mongolia who was nine feet, but there's nobody 10 feet tall, mm. taller. So there are reports, very credible reports of discoveries of such things. My particular problem is I haven't been able to uh, verify any of them. One of the best reports of evidence that might be verifiable was the discovery by a French anthropologist uh, at a place called Castlemel in southern France, where he discovered uh, very large human bones, not a complete skeleton, but uh, a human femur, human uh, humerus, which is the upper arm bone from the shoulder down to the elbow, and s several other bones. And if you have a, a femur or a thigh bone, you measure it. You know, anthropologists can tell you how tall the human being that had that femur had to, had to be. And they calculated that the human being that possessed this thigh bone or femur must have been 11 feet tall or more. <laughs> and this was in a published in scientific, uh, a scientific journal with, I mean, early in the 20th century with photographs and if those bones could be found in France today, possibly they're in some museum somewhere, that would be pretty good evidence. As far as the other reports go, there are reports that the Smithsonian had the... I was going to say the Smithsonian, yeah. 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 And I, I fully accept that giants existed, but if... If we try to actually ha get at least one case where we actually have the physical bones, I think that would help, mm -hmm. you know, demonstrate the reality of the phenomena. But up to this time, I haven't been able to s see or verify that such bones are still there today.
you know, that's, uh, but as I said, I fully accept that in the past, there were human beings larger than we are today. It's like you were saying, the pre-Adamite people, the mm. bigger. The Vedic literature says that in past ages, people were bigger than they are today. Mm -hmm. And it's even part of just ordinary science that before five or 10,000 years ago, most of the things were bigger than they are today. You know, the elephants were bigger, the wolves mm -hmm. were bigger, the bears were bigger, the trees were bigger. I live in California. We have the California redwood trees, mm -hmm. which are actually the largest living things on earth. As far as I know, mm -hmm. uh, they're huge, 300 feet tall. And the dinosaurs, <laughs> no, nobody disputes the dinosaurs either. And they were, <laughs> they were pretty big. Yeah. yeah. Big I think it was today. Yes. Yeah. It's all part of our limitation. Have you also read Madame Blavatsky? Uh, I haven't deeply and intricately studied her, her work, but I, I, I know of it. And I've been invited to speak at theosophical groups in different countries around the world. So I know a, a little bit about it. I, 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 I'm not expert in her. Her, I mean, she talks about root races and mm -hmm. things like that. Yeah, she talks about the ionosphere, the ring pass knot, about how the, the prana, prana from the sun and the energies have been gradually limited after each, after Atlantis, after Lemurius, because of, because we needed to go back, back into, you were talking about a classroom earlier, we're here to learn. And, you know, if you fail, you go back, they tweet, send you back a, a year and we're going lower and lower and getting smaller and smaller. So yeah. Yeah. Have you also read, uh, the Rig Vedas? Uh, the Rig Ved. I, I have. They also mention the Brahma weapon there and Indra's dart and that ties in with what Madame Blavatsky said about, uh, how they, they discovered they had nuclear weapons in, in ancient civilization, just to give you an idea of how advanced they were. Yeah, they had, well, it, in the Puranas, it's called a Brahmastra. And the effect of it was it's described like if you had thousands of suns all concentrated in one place, the energy that comes out of the Brahmastra would be something like that. And it's interesting that Robert Oppenheimer, who was the physicist in charge of developing an atomic bomb for the United States during World War II, uh, in addition to being a great physicist, he was also a student of Sanskrit and he had read, uh, works like the Rig Veda and the Bhagavad Gita where the, you find descriptions of these things, like this weapon that explodes with the force of thousands of suns. And at the time, the first American atomic bomb was tested in 1945 in Alamogordo, New Mexico. He was present in the bunker. And when the flash of the bomb went off, he, he began reciting some verses from the Bhagavad Gita, where this type of thing is explained. And the, and a newspaper reporter asked him once, what was it like to be present? when the first atomic explosion was tested and he replied, you mean the first atomic explosion in recent times? Yeah. So that's mm -hmm. kind of interesting. 
really mate i mean yeah if so if if these numbers that i showed said were correct if it had been on this earth for 18 million years just just say as a thought experiment like that amount of history the amount i mean there's a real it's not just a cover-up like of of a few bones is it saying oh man's not this you know man is actually much older we were probably you know we spend millions of years as animal we wouldn't there's a there's a it's a big campaign though there's a secrecy and yeah i i think there were a lot of reasons for this knowledge filtering process one is it's just human nature and for example if i love someone and I hear somebody say something bad about that person. Uh, I, I may become, you know, angry and, you know, I won't like to hear it. Don't want anybody else to hear it. So many scientists are very much in love with their theories. And if they hear something that contradicts it, they become you know, defensive, mm. react, you know, negatively. So that's, uh, that's, I think, one aspect of it. And uh, another aspect of it, I think, has to do with power. And yeah, there are different types of power in this world. There's military power, there's economic power, there's political power. There's also intellectual power, which is a very subtle power, but a very real one. And those who possess it, I believe, have the ability to uh, dictate to us our sense of identity. And through their control of the education system, I think the scientific establishment is promoting a certain sense of identity, which is I am a machine made of molecules and competition with other machines made of molecules individually and in groups. You know, that competition is there for uh, the control of the material resources and the material production and the wealth that it generates. So, uh, according to that sense of identity, I would tend to believe that my purpose in life basically is to produce and consume more and more material things and certain groups profit from that. Yeah, they, they control people on that basis. And uh, if we had another sense of identity, and I, I'm not just a machine made of molecules, I have a conscious self, a being of pure consciousness. You're a being of pure consciousness. We're all beings of pure consciousness. We can satisfy our material needs in the most simple, natural, efficient, and fair way possible while putting most of our human energy into developing that resource of, of consciousness. It would be an entirely different kind of civilization, different political arrangements, different financial arrangements different security arrangements. It would be, you know, we would be saying, well, on the level of consciousness, we're all related. So why divide ourselves up into so many competing groups and in the process of, of exploiting material resources in an unsustainable way? destroying the environment and generating conflict in all levels of human society. It's, uh, so this power, the ability to 
influence people to identify in a certain way, I think is is at the root of a lot of the, the problems the world faces. And there are powerful interests, financial, political, military interests that want to keep things like that. So I think that's uh, one reason for the prominence of material science in the world today. That's their function to kind of keep us that very limited traditional understanding of our identity and purpose in this world. See, yeah, a lot of my work is I'm fighting the, the materialism, the, the message of materialism. And you know, if you if we were talking about reincarnation earlier and that, you know, consciousness continues after death. And if yes. you if you think about that, then there are, we have these life between lives. So we, we die, we reincarnate, we, we come back here with no memory of our other, of our other, of our other time around, because it would be very confusing. You no, know, it's like you're saying it would, if we had to remember all our past lives, we'd, we'd yeah. go, to, we'd go chasing our, chasing our exes. We'd go with, we try and get our property back. We'd try and right wrongs. So it would be a mess. But, um, I think when we go to the, to the astral plane, according to the teachings of the Ethereum society, you do retain memory and the more advanced you are or the more evolved or the more involved because as above as below. So if you're an involved person, an advanced who's practiced the dark arts and you go to the astral, you can time runs at different speed there, but you can, you can influence the physical plane to your own dark ends and the, the, we are run by the, the dark the dark forces who are using feeding on the, um, our, our own bad, our bad thoughts and the fear that we generate. So. Yeah, that's, I, I, I do say, yes, we are on this level of reality in content in different ways with beings, more subtle beings. So, uh, higher platforms and, uh, and just like, and you know, we can observe on this level of reality, different categories of personalities, you know, so we would consider to be good and on the path of light. Others are causing pain and suffering to themselves and others and appear to be you know, like on the dark side, you might say. Uh, so those same kinds of differences are there, uh, the more subtle realms. Yeah. And they're still learning the lessons they need to learn. I mean, you go, they call it the realm of just desserts. So you go to, if you're, if you're a very spiritual person, it's the same in a city now, if you, you go to the street or the district that you vibrate at, no, you don't hang out in the ghetto. If you're, if you're like the, the culture and the, the fine arts, you know, it's the same. And so the, 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 the astral realms are, you know, science is almost there. No, it's got, they understands dark matter and dark energy. I know where is it? You know, they think, they think it's somewhere between the planets, you know, all this energy is the, the, the calculations don't add up, but it's it's right here in front of us. It's this, it's, it's at this, it's just consciousness, a different frequency, light. It's across the electromagnetic spectrum, matter existing at different vibrations. So, you know, there could be, a, I could be under a mountain or another realm or under, under a sea on another realm, but it's still physical, but it's just a different frequency. Yeah. In some of the Vedic texts, we get the concept of the three modes of material nature, they're called gunas in Sanskrit. Right. Three gunas, three gunas. Yeah. Goodness, passion, ignorance. And those, Sattvic. Yeah. Tarajasic and Tamasic. Yes, those three. 
Sattva Rajas Tamas. So Sattva is the mode of goodness. A person attracted to the mode of goodness likes to live simply, naturally, is peaceful, is caring, compassionate, wants to help others, and is dedicated to improving the state of consciousness individually and collectively. The rajasic types are more interested in accumulating wealth and opulence and power and, you know, they can, if they're guided by those in the mode of sattva, the sattva guna, they can do tremendous good for people. But if they give in to their selfish inclinations, they can do, they have the power to do a lot of damage. And then there are the tamasic types that are just into behaving. You know, they tend to be addicted to intoxicants, acting crazily, you know, they're just mm. a, a disturbance really to themselves and others. But yeah, you know, the modes don't exist in a totally pure state. You know, in, in the course of a day, one might be influenced in the morning by sattva, during the day, a little rajasic impulses come. And then later on, you may just think, let me go to sleep. <laughs> you need a mix, otherwise you wouldn't, it'd be a terrible yeah. day. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I had a guess. That don't. would be to be. And as far as the bhakti tradition goes, the ultimate would be to get beyond the material modes to the level of pure consciousness and where there's, you're not being influenced by the material modes of nature. Well, here you go. You might find this interesting because this is the teachings of the Ethereum Society is that there's, there's spiritual evolution, there's consciousness evolves and it, we have, we can't go, we have to go back to God collectively, basically, you know, you think of the Eastern traditions, you think of the, the, the Buddhist tradition, you go, Nirvana is one step away as you ascend, wham, bam, I'm back to the almighty. I, I've, I've, I've ascended now after cosmic consciousness and enlightenment, but from we understand from these teachings that consciousness accumulates, amalgamates on its way back to God. So, so even a galaxy can't go back to God because it hasn't transmuted matter. It's still in, it's still in matter. So it's a conscious being, but it's still, it's in service, but it's not, it can't. So, and below that are sons, conscious beings, the Brahma, the, the Brahma of the Hindu scripts, the God in the Bible is the sun conscious being and the earth underneath is a, is a conscious being and, you know, pl planets merge to make suns merge to make greater and greater beings. And so we, as we, as we evolve, as we raise Kundalini and we can leave this classroom, I actually spoke to an, an Ayurvedic, um, uh, doctor on one of my other, on my other podcast, odd songs and he. I told him though all the other I was talking about all the other planets are inhabited as well, just at a different frequency of vibration. And he said, yeah, I know though it's in the, it's in the Vedas. As I was quite surprised, you know, it's all in this, this coded language, but what we've got with the Ethereum society is we, Dr. King was, um, is that was the, um, he is the master for the Aquarian age. So Jesus was the master for the Piscean age. And so Dr. King came here and he channeled these teachings and we got the book called the nine freedoms and it shows how consciousness amalgamates as you go, you leave this classroom, you go into that, you go back to God through the planets, you go Saturnian existence and you, you merge with another being who you vibrate at. 
and you merge again later on after solar existence. And so the earth is a living conscious being, but it's million. Imagine Jesus, the Buddha, Sri Krishna, and all these adepts and masters merged together, millions of years evolved. They can create a consciousness of a level of a, of a planet, of Loga of a planet. So that's the kind of this, this evolving back to God collectively. We, we don't just go into a cave now and yeah. you know, we have to be among our, our, our brothers and sisters serving collectively each other. And that's kind of the new concept for the Aquarian age. Yeah. It, it, it sounds reminiscent of, of the teachings of one of the great St. Lee persons in the Bhakti tradition, Prahlad, you know, who, who was a boy saying that he prayed, you know, I don't want to just get liberated myself, you know, go off to the forest and, you know, raise my consciousness. I feeling I want to go with everyone, you know, like, so I go to the cities, the, the people are, the conscious selves are, and trying to go with them. It's just a similar mentality. Ah. And then it's not, uh, it was ahead of his time. Yeah. Uh, well, so sometimes that happens. Everything is there and seen for at the right moment. It sprouts and grows and gives its fruit. I think there was some allowance in the law made for selfishness in the, in the pursuit of spiritual advancement that, that somehow you had to convince people that if they because obviously when you, when you do raise Kundalini, when you become an adept and a master, you are, you can serve much more. You are much greater use to humanity. So maybe they needed these, maybe you needed these people to climb the rock face first, send down the ropes. And then they're now working in the, um, their ascended masters working in the, in the spiritual hierarchy of earth, you know, behind the scenes to, to raise us all up. But now because time is, time is ticking. Now we all have to work. Now services come. Karma yoga is the, is the yoga of the age. I think you're right. The time is today. Uh, this Kali Yuga that's predicted to be, you know, the age that we're in now, it, it's predicted in the Vedic literature to be an age of increasing social and environmental disturbance. And it appears to be going on like that, but, uh, uh, but there's also a prediction that for the next say 10,000 years, there's a, a window of opportunity where there's, uh, a, a chance, an opportunity to make a lot of spiritual progress. Just like when winter's coming, you get some warm days sometimes, you know, like Indian summer, sometimes they call it. Although the trend is down in terms of the temperature, you get some warm, warm days. So according to some of the text that we're in such a window of opportunity even though it is calling you good. That, that really resonates. Yeah. These are, there is this satellite number three is in orbit, magnifying all spiritual actions by 3000 times because to Dr. King, he was one that I'll show you this one as well. I'll show you this screen. So all these masters came back, can't come from other planets. They incarnate in earth in a physical body through the womb of a woman to, to take on karma. And then they, they can act in the earth. So they come from Jesus was from Venus, St. Peter, uh, Dr. George King, who I mentioned, who founded the Ethereum society, he was from Mars. Um, 
and all these these masters through the age. That's why there's this this linear. That's why there's this red line through all the great world's great religions. Is that they were teaching Patanjali there, or Buddha? They all they're all teaching the same thing of the the cosmic the cosmic message basically. So, Zoriasta. Sri Krishna started the age, his death mark, the start of Kali Yuga. Yeah. 3000. Yeah. That's the beginning. And the Maha, the Lord Babaji, he has been in a, he has been in a, I think he's been in the physical body for 2 million years on earth. And he is from, from Saturn. So all these, you know, people are looking for, for a life on other planets. And it's all there, but just a different frequency of vibration. And we are in the, we're in the bottom classroom. Right. Yeah. And so, I could, and so, yeah, life is present on all these planets, but we may not be able to detect it as, as you say, because our consciousness is not at the right frequency. So, so Dr. King, his, his, all these masters, they have a, they have a mission, a primary mission, a secondary mission. So the master of Jesus, they were doing teaching and he was doing healing and things like that. And, you know, but his main mission was to die at a particular time to take on karma. Otherwise man would have been set back 17,000 years or something like that. And because of the primary initiation of earth, that would have been a, that would have been a very would have held back, held everything back. So, and Dr. King, his primary mission was besides the teachings, he was the, he was terrestrial mental channel, but his main mission was, so he was like a, basically a Jedi. So he, he did astral projection into the lower astral realms and he took on the, the leaders of the dark forces, um, in the apocalypse, which happened on the, as predicted, but not on the physical plane, it happened on the on the astral, on the lower astral planes. Sorry. And he also took on uh, the alien as well, which was a, an advanced AI basically, which could, could create thought forms, I think up to 40 miles in diameter. So it was a, it was a crazy time. <laughs> yeah. Beyond science fiction, basically. Cause you know, science fiction can only ever goes like 20 years in advance because people don't have any greater grasp of thinking beyond that. But, uh, well, I think this has been a, it's been a fantastic conversation. If you have anything, we could keep chatting all night, but, uh, I'm sure you've got other things to do. Uh, yeah, it, if the world's. People are interested in my work. Uh, they can visit my website at cremo.com, m c r e m o dot com. There they'll they'll find information about my my books like Forbidden Archaeology, Human Devolution, some others. Actually, my latest book is My Science, My Religion. And if people order that from my website, they will have the option of also receiving, if they want it, a free copy of Bhagavad Gita, which is one of the Vedic texts that has greatly influenced my work. And they would also find uh, an interview link that would be announcing uh, my appearances, media appearances like this, this, uh, podcast, and, uh, they'd also find upcoming in-person events like, uh, next week, April 1st through the 4th, I'm going to be at Mount Shasta and the conference there, the conscious living summit and it's, uh, I'll be, I'll be speaking at that event. So good to have been with you today. Oh, it's been a real pleasure. So I'm on your website now.
So you have other websites as well, human devolution, my science, my religion.com. Yeah. Those are for the individual books. Yeah. Which books. Okay. Mount Shasta is a, is a, a spiritual, a retreat for the spiritual hierarchy of earth. That's a very sacred mountain. Yeah. I, I've heard that. Yes. The Saint is there. No, not that I know of. Saint Guling, he, who, who visualized the Ethereum society into being, he did it inside Mount Shasta. He, he, he's based inside there. He's the, he's the keeper of the seal for the, the, the uh, great white brotherhood. What is the name we give? Uh, Saint Guling. He is the, he is the, uh, the master and, yes. and it's the, it's the great white brotherhood or spiritual hierarchy of earth. Great white brotherhood because they're, well, they're mostly Indians and mixture of men and women, but, uh, it's white magic. That's why it's, why it's got that name. Okay. But it's a spiritual hierarchy of earth. So yeah, deep inside the mountain. I don't think so. Do they have a community up there? Um, well, it's, um, it's the great, it's the spiritual hierarchy of earth. So they want you, they, you won't see them unless they want to be seen. They are, oh, okay. they're, they're ascended masters. So they're like, um, you know, people who spoke to Madame Blavatsky and, um, they're, I, I understand that. Appreciate mm, that. Yeah. I would love to meet one of them. If you, if you do see me, any of them, let me know. <laughs> okay. I'd love to have one on the show, but I don't think that's going to happen. I think I'd be way above my pay grade. Yeah. Uh, maybe they'll be feeling a little compassion. Uh, I wouldn't know what to, what would you say if you met an ascended master? I mean, what would you, what would you ask them? I mean, what would you, you know, they can read your mind. They can, well, uh, in that case, I would say you're in my heart and you know, everything. Tell me yeah. what I need to know. Tell me what to do. Yeah. <laughs> what I need to know. Yeah. 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 Got it. That looks beautiful. Yeah. I'm sure you have a lovely time in spring in Mount Shasta must be a, well, the energy there will be off the scale. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. All right. Well, thanks again, Michael. It's been a real pleasure. Okay, Jack. You have a great day. You too. And all your viewers and listeners. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Namaste. Namaste.